Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders. We speak with each one to one. It's impossible to pigeonhole today's guest. She's professor of English at Queens College, CUNY. She was the inaugural scholar in residence in the Ray Charles Chair in African American Culture at Dillard University in New Orleans. She's a linguist, writer, and culinary historian. And Jessica Harris's latest book, High in the Hog, A Culinary Journey from Africa to America, has just been published by Bloomsbury. It's already received mouthwatering reviews. Welcome. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl. Your book is, I mean, how do I describe it? Uh, <laughs> A History of African Americans' Connection with Food from Africa to Present-Day America. It's about the food they grew, the food they ate, the way they cooked it, how they supported themselves in the food business, and the contribution that they made to the eating and cooking habits of the countries they came from and came to. Is that pretty good? That's pretty good. Okay. What compelled you to write this book? Oh, goodness. Um, I kind of have a grandmother who sits on each shoulder and they beat me up when I'm not behaving properly and they also inform me of things and, and I mean no I'm not going into who land here but the point is that my grandmother's stories had not really shown up in the same kind of way that I would like to talk about them. Equally one of the things that I thought was fascinating was that as I wrote cookbooks and I've been writing cookbooks for longer than I want to talk about in public forum um, the head notes, those little notes in the top of each recipe got longer and longer and longer and longer. And it finally occurred to me, maybe the maybe grandmothers and the head notes <laughs> might mean that there's a book there. Okay. Let's play a word association game. Corn and pork. Hog and hominy, the staples of the diet of the enslaved. Okra, watermelon, black-eyed peas foods that came to us from the African continent that we don't necessarily always know came from the African continent. Um, was pork a part of the African diet or was that something they started eating when they got it's here? It's kind of a New World association and admixture. There may have been pigs, but they weren't consumed anywhere to the degree that they're consumed here now. Okay. Uh, so much territory to cover. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with the journey to this country on the slave ships because I was intrigued by, it was the first uh, I heard about the kinds of food that they, they that, that the slaves ate aboard the slave ships and how it was served to them. What were they fed? Well, I mean, we talk about, uh, you know, the transatlantic slave trade and we tend to talk about it fairly obliquely. We, we you know, if we refer to it all, it's just that sort of uh, hyphen between Africa and America. I kind of like to, in fact, the chapter is entitled Sea Change, which takes us back to Robert Hayden's Middle Passage, which takes us back to Shakespeare's The Tempest. That whole idea of what happens when you undergo a sea change. And one of the big parts for Africans in diaspora, Africans in that transatlantic slave who, trade who had become enslaved, was that sea change, was that horrific, unspeakable journey one of the things that happened was um, they were fed all sorts of things. They were fed mashes. They were fed, um, by mashes I mean these sort of mixes of, of cooked rice, of um, cooked down yams, of things of that sort. Uh, the, probably the most infamous is something called slabber sauce that uh, had uh, ropey beef or, you know, hard tack and that was cooked into this sort of repellently named slabber sauce. Who'd want to eat it? It's not something I want to see right, when I make right. it. Right, right. That was then dished up. The meals were served twice a day on most ships. On deck. On deck because they had to, we're not going to talk about the holes because that really isn't what my mother would call table talk. And even if we're not having a meal, we're right. seated at a table. But they had to clean them out and they but had they to get some fresh air. they had to sluice them out and they had to get some fresh air in and they had to exercise. And so with all of that, they were served on deck. They were given spoons to eat with or shells depending on what and when in the, the ships. Different ships had different feeding regimens, if mm -hmm. you will. 
but in general, they had a meal that might apply or refer to the Africa that they had left one time a day, and a meal that might have something more like boiled horse beans, which would be fava right. beans mixed with lard, or that repellently named slabber sauce another time of day. And mealtime was kind of dangerous because... Mealtime was extraordinarily dangerous because, first of all, you had to unchain people to a certain extent, bring them up on deck. They were able to sort of congregate and see each other. It was a prime time for mutinies. So that in many cases, the enslaved Africans, as they were being served, for want of a better word, um, were watched by the entire crew at full attention, you know, guns drawn, to make sure that there were no mutinies. Right. So blacks came here either as slaves or as indentured servants until, you know, you, until you got hereditary, you know, slavery. Um, some of them became cooks for the people who owned them or who they, who they worked for, uh, who were indentured to. Um, you write about, I guess some people would think that that was a cushy job, you know, you know, working in the kitchen, but you talk right about the difficulties and dangers of hearth cooking. Oh my goodness, well the difficulties and dangers of hearth cooking are, are legion. And, and I think one of the things that's, that's interesting is we tend to forget how much the new nation that would become America, because, you know, Africans got here for the first in 1619, which is before the Mayflower. There are 13 colonies, not even at that point. So when you get all of these people here, it's an agricultural nation. People are, you know, not, well, I mean, they, some of them are living in, in these growing cities, but they're, they're basically working the land. And so the indentured were there to work the land. And as indenture hardened into enslavement, that working the land kept up and kept right on going. So that uh, traditionally, from probably moment of arrival, the, the indentured Africans whose descendants then and who joined with the enslaved Africans became initiated into what I call the nitty gritty of the food chain. They had to grow it. Then they had to harvest it. Then they had to process it. Then they had to cook it. Then they had to serve it. Right. And if you really want to get into it, then they had to empty the chamber pots. So right. they had the full circle of it. Right, right. How did the diet of slaves, I mean, I, all of us have some concept of what we think the slaves ate. How did their diet differ from that of the people who owned them? Oh. Uh, it depends, and I mean, I think one of the things that was a revelation to me about writing the book was just the diverse methodologies, if you will, of enslavement. There's no kind of monolithic slavery in this country. There's what happened in the low country as opposed to what happened in parts of rural Georgia as opposed to what happened in Virginia. But if you start thinking of our classic, you know, white columns, Tara da 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 um, what you're talking about at that point is you're talking about a kind of enslavement where the enslaved blacks at this point, who may not have any recollection of Africa, are now being given a diet of what uh, one scholar has called hog meat and hominy. So there's corn in some form, there's pig meat in some form, usually what I believe the correct, you know, sort of la -di da fancy term for now is the less noble parts of the pig. Right. That would be the ears, the tail, the feet, the head, and a bucket of guts. That would be the hog maws and the chitlins. Right, right. And so that would be part, um, parcel of the diet. Now, depending on various methodologies, sometimes the food was all cooked in a central place and people would go and get their meal. Sometimes the food was rationed and each family would then cook its own. But the kind of overarching thing was usually lack. You know, this is not a great diet. Um, it's not a healthy diet. It's not a healthy diet. And certainly. sometimes they, were, uh, they, they supplemented their diet. That's exactly right? where I was headed. So I mean, so you need leafy greens, what are you gonna do? You're gonna forage. Uh, in some cases, people begin to um, do things like grow their own, and I was, as the British would say, gobsmacked to discover that the enslaved on Thomas Jefferson's farm grew their own 
produce. He even provided on some occasions seeds for them. Mm -hmm. And they grew things and when they had a surplus or sometimes with the strict intention of having food not only for their own consumption but to sell. And they actually sold things like pumpkins, things, um, I'm trying to think of something else, but pumpkins are what come most immediately to mind, right. I think cucumbers, back to Jefferson himself who purchases. So this is a whole nother way of looking at slavery. Right, right. Um, you had African-American street vendors. Oh, good Lord, yes. Either slaves or free, right? Well, by the time you start thinking about urban enslavement, now we've got the sort of the growing of these towns that are going to become our major cities, and in many cases our major seaports, because, you know, the country certainly grew from east to west, from the seaports more inland. But you start thinking about these towns early on in New York City, vendors selling roast corn. And one of the things that was interesting to read was that kind of cry, roast corn, you know, and people would get very agitated. People not being the Africans, being, you know, the Europeans would be very agitated about the African street vendors. Uh, later on, and perhaps even parallel time, in South Carolina, the vendors were regulated. Right. They had to wear slave badges, badges that gave them the right to sell X or Y on the street. Now, one of the things that happened there is a gentleman wrote at some point that, and I'm sort of paraphrasing rather cruelly, but with the general idea, the Negro should suppress his wit because the vendors were apparently doing what street vendors do. They were coming up with a rhyme. They were coming up with a rhythm. They were coming up with a call that was distinctive so that their customers would know who they were. Right, right. I mean, in New Orleans, there were women who sold kala. Kala are rice fritters. I believe that the name comes from the Bong, uh, from Bong County, Liberia, which would make sense because that's a rice growing region. These are sort of deep fried rice balls that are, you know, sort of covered in powdered sugar now and you know, being resuscitated, if you will, in New Orleans. But back in the day, they used to be served by women, black women, who would go, kala, kala, belle, kala, toucho, moi, gagne, kala. And so everybody had a cry. Right. And the cry was recognizable. And so the street vendors were really very much a part of the soundscape of the cities. If you think about Gershwin, if you think about Orgy and Bess with that strawberries. Right. That's what, that's what every so city So fresh started. and fine and just from off the vine. Talking about strawberries. <laughs> <We're> gonna... <laughs> it's also a beautiful lyric, too. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with more with Jessica Harris, author of High on the Hog, Culinary Journey from Africa to America. Yes. That's it. to be perfect to be a perfect parent. When you adopt a child from foster care, just being there makes all the difference. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Queens College professor Jessica B. Harris, author of High on the Hog, A Culinary Journey from Africa to America. It's just been published by Bloomsbury. Even in slavery times, there were some very accomplished black master chefs. Uh, Her George Washington's chef, Hercules, Thomas Jefferson's chef, James Hemings. Absolutely. I mean, and, and others, probably untold others that we know not the names of. But I think that Hercules and Hemings in many ways stand for both of them because they had such parallel and yet different paths. I mean, you know, it's extraordinary to think that the father of the country had slaves, and yet he did, as did many of the signers of the Declaration right. of Independence. And in fact, at the time of the Declaration of Independence, there was no state without the taint, if you will, of slavery. So one of the things that becomes interesting is to look at this enslaved person under the father of the country. I was recently in Philadelphia, and they have now opened a part of the Liberty Bell. As you approach the Liberty Bell, uh, what, where it's located, 
you go through an open air kind of exhibit called the President's House, where Hercules is interpreted by um, actors on uh, flat screen TV. Oh, really? Yeah, which is really fascinating. But one of the things that's fascinating is Hercules cooked for Washington. He was undoubtedly a young black child who grew up on Mount Ver at Mount Vernon. Um, grew up probably in the kitchen, might have been related to other house servants, who somehow works his way up the culinary ladder and becomes the head chef. And we're talking about high-level cooking. High-level cooking. He cooked not only for the uh, Washington family meals, he cooked for the congressional dinners. He oversaw a kitchen in which others cooked under him, and he was known to be quite the martinet. He was equally known to be a quite dandy. the dandy. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, so that uh, Hercules apparently would s step out into the streets of Philadelphia with immaculate linen, you know, silk shorts and a waistcoat and a cocked hat and carried a gold-handled cane. And this is a slave. He's and a slave. And he is enslaved. And he also had an income of about two hundred dollars a year, which was no small sum. From the perquisites, he could sell leftover food. He could sell tallow. So he was. He was somebody. And James Hemings was taken by Jefferson to France and uh, trained in French cooking. Absolutely. I mean, Jeff uh, Jefferson sent for Hemings. I think Hemings arrives in 1784, which is just four years, uh, five years before the Bastille. So he's in France at this incredibly pivotal time in French history. And he is apprenticed to all sorts of chefs. First, to the chef who had done the catering for the Jefferson embassy, if you will. Then he goes up and up and up the scale until he finally becomes apprentice to the chef for the Prince de Condé. And the Prince de Condé are the noble de, no, uh, members of the noblesse de l'épée, the nobility of the sword, or as we might say, princes of the blood. And so, incredible. Mm -hmm. And this man learns all sorts of things, and yet, and here's the, the trick between the two, Hercules escapes. Hemings remains enslaved, although he could have self-manumitted in France, returns to the United States, and petitions Jefferson for his freedom, which Jefferson grants. Right. Provided he will cook, teach someone else to cook, mm -hmm. he teaches his brother. his brother. So these diverging paths, amazing. Right. Now, and even during slavery, you had, uh, an, uh, at least in Philadelphia, you had a number of blacks uh, who were made a lot of money as caterers. Oh, absolutely. Certainly, well, after slavery kind of had ended in the North, but Philadelphia was such a hub. Okay. Because of its Quaker background, because of its sort of underpinnings, I guess pre-abolitionist underpinnings, uh, somehow or other Philadelphia became a great hub for the importance of African American culture. Um, if you think of churches, Mother Bethel, in terms of the origin of the AME churches and so on and so forth. So you find that Philadelphia was that pivotal city. And in Philadelphia, a gentleman named Robert Bogle uh, somehow or other starts out as a waiter, uh, crafts uh, an employment called public butler. Families that didn't have enough money to have a, their own butler. He was a freelance Could butler. kind of run a butler. Right. You know, and he was a public butler. And he goes from being a public butler to employing others as public butlers, thereby creating this whole sort of almost union of caterers. And he becomes so important that Mr. Biddle, and Biddle, if you know Philadelphia, is a very important Philadelphia name, Biddle writes an ode to Bogle in which he sort of glorifies Bogle in, in grand, and you can sort of hear it being recited in stentorian terms, uh, that um, Biddle kind of took care of all of the upper crust of Philadelphia from birth to earth, from, right. you know, as they say in West Side Story, from womb to tomb. Right, right. And there were, you know, a, num you know, a, a number of freed blacks who went west and, you know, established, you know, made money in the cooking business, the boarding house business, the restaurant business. Uh, but I'm going to skip forward because I have to get to Pickford Mary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we were talking about street vendors, and you start talking about street vendors. Then if you flash forward from the early days of Republic to the 20s, and you're now in the middle of the Great Migrations, you know, the teens, the post-World War I years when Africans or 
black Americans at this point want to get the heck out of the South, which is becoming increasingly repressive, they head north. They head north in search of jobs. They head north in search of education. They head north in search of, for want of a better word, freedom. This wonderful woman comes up from the Mississippi Delta. She is illiterate. She has no skills that one would think would make her employable in any way. She arrives in Harlem. She finds work as a domestic and somehow amasses what is a fair sum, $5. With that $5, she spends $3 on buying a baby carriage and a boiler, you know, sort of one of those old clothes boilers. And somehow or other, she cobbles together on the baby carriage the boiler and some way of heating the boiler. So, the, and with her extra remaining two dollars, she buys pig's feet and whatever else she needs. And so she then sets up shop at 135th Street in Lenox and sells pig's feet. Now, do you like pig's feet? I've never had a pig's feet, oh, I must say. Oh, no. Okay, well, pig's feet. One of the things about pig's feet is... Not much meat on it. Not much meat <laughs> on it. Lots of little bones that are fun to suck. Right. Lots of gristle, a little skin to chew on, and you put some hot sauce on them. That can keep you going for a while. And Pigfoot Mary sold pig's feet. She couldn't have made an awful lot of money, you wouldn't think. But she made enough money to buy a building in Harlem and then subsequent buildings for Harlem. And by the time she dies in 1929, she's gone to California. And when she dies, she uh, leaves the royal sum, not too bad, of 347, if I'm not mistaken, thousand dollars. Not bad. All from selling okay. pig's feet. Now, if you could meet only one of the characters that you wrote about who are no longer with us, Hmm. Which one would you like most like to meet? Wow. I'm not sure about that. I think we've mentioned some of them. Um, I'm really not sure okay. about that. I think, you know, maybe Hemings or Hercules. Okay. But equally, I would love to meet somebody like um, Lena Richard. Lena Richard, who in the 40s, and early 50s becomes the first black woman, probably in the country, to have a television show. And she has a food show mm -hmm. in New Orleans and is pretty amazing there. So, I mean, there, there's so many people. I mean, there are just so many folks. I want to meet them all. Right. <laughs> now, um, we're, we're talking about the Harlem, the Harlem maybe in the 1920s. Um, you said there was a sort of cultural divide in what black people ate, you know, depending on whether you were working class or depending on whether you were the black bourgeoisie. Was it, was... Well, I mean, I think, I think there was, and I think to a certain extent there may still be a little bit of that. I think, um, I think certainly there are two threads, if not more. Mm -hmm. Certainly today there are multiple threads within... Um, the foods consumed by African Americans, because the whole definition of who is an African American is expanding. Right. Um, but I think back in the 20s, certainly, uh, Du Bois's talented 10th was not eating the same things as the folks who were buying those pig feet from Pigfoot Mary. But I bet they were eating fried chicken and cornbread. Well, they might have been eating fried chicken. The cornbread might have been a little bit more debatable, but I okay. think they were definitely eating fried chicken. But. Um, but that was not all they were eating. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look and you read some of the, the tales of the times, um, the little parties with the Ritz cracker with one small piece of cheese on top of it was often bemoaned by those who wrote. It's like, no, this is not party food. Right. You know, this is something else. Mm -hmm. So you had this sort of cultural divide and the culinary divide as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. At what point did soul food start to go upscale? Um, I'm not even sure. I mm -hmm. think, uh, I think soul food may have started to go upscale probably in the 80s or thereabouts because I think what happened was after it became known, became well known, then people began to search for other ways of, of dealing with it. And upscale may have simply dealt with presentation. It may have been served in a white tablecloth restaurant as opposed to on a four mica counter. Right. So, you know, 
it's all about upscale. And also, and, and, and we're talking not just about the tr traditional black slash southern food, but we're talking about Creole, we're talking about Africa, all kinds of... Well, now when we talk about the food the, of African the Americans, there's so much in the pot. I mean, what isn't in the pot? Right. You know, I was just reading something yesterday where somebody said, I didn't grow up eating hog and hominy. You know, I was a hippie's child. I grew up with dreadlocks eating tofu. Mm -hmm. But as we expand, as we, you know, sort of change our definition of who is African American, um, we have a whole new world. You know, we are the world in that sense. We are culinary omnivores. Everything from the Kenyan Ugali that might have been eaten by the president's father. Right straight through to the, um, the cornbread, and actually they're very much related. Right. Um, that might have been eaten by my great-grandfather to the, um, the fried fish and fungi mm -hmm. that might have been eaten by someone else's grandparent. Right. Um, but they're all in the pot, and they're all now African-American. It's kind of wonderful. Yeah. Well, um, I love your title. You know, if, if you want to know where she got the title from, you have to read the book because we don't have go. time to tell you now. Uh, I want to thank Jessica Harris for joining us today. Look for her book, High on the Hog, A Culinary Journey from Africa to America, for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy.